This is the Bringing Business to Retail podcast with today's guest, Dr. Roberta Shaler. Welcome to the Bringing Business to Retail podcast on selenanight.com. Stay ahead of the competition by opening your doors to business experts so you can learn, grow, and be inspired. Passionate about bringing business strategies to independent retailers, please welcome your host, Selena Knight. Hey there, and welcome to this week's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. Let me ask you if you have one of these people in your life, the kind of people who just drain all of your energy. Like when you meet with them, you come back feeling exhausted. I know that I have had a few people in my life who have been exactly like that. You know, emotional energy vampires who just seem hell bent on making sure that everybody is unhappy, (laughs) as unhappy as they are. And it can be really difficult to extricate yourself from that person or those people, especially if there's somebody who is close to you. So today I've got on the show Dr. Roberta Shaler, and she is going to talk to you all about a type of person that she has coined the term for hijackals. And I think it makes perfect sense. The kind of people who literally just hijack your life for the good of their own, for the purpose of making themselves feel better, feel stronger, feel like they are in control. And I'm sure when you listen to this episode, whether it is a relative, whether it's a friend, whether it's a, perhaps it's even a customer, these kinds of people can really mess up our lives and our headspace. So you are going to love today's episode. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. And by listening to Dr. Roberta, I'm sure you're going to be able to identify if these people cross your path in the future. If you are lucky enough not to have any of them of them in your life right now, being able to identify these kinds of people, and we do have some examples of customers in the podcast of who do this, then if you have Roberta's tips and tricks on how to deal with these people, your life is going to be so much easier. Having support and guidance and someone to show you the way and be there for you in life and in business is so important, not only for our growth, but for our emotional space, for our heart space, and of course, for our business and life space. So just before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you that if you have ever thought about working with me, the doors to my coaching programs are closing. If you're listening to this as soon as the episode goes live, you've got about 24 hours to get your application in. Other than that, you are going to have to wait several months before the doors open again. So if it's something that you've thought about, if it's something that's been in the back of your mind that you would love to have that person there to help you grow your business, head on over to selenanight.com forward slash coaching and see if it looks right for you. It's not going to be right for everybody, but if this is the right type of your life to make that next step, head on over to selenanight.com forward slash coaching. Have a look at what's available. And if you feel like it's the right thing to do, pop your information into the application form and we will be in touch. Okay, let's not let these hijackals take control of our life. Let's get ourselves empowered with Dr. Roberta right now. Hey there, and welcome to this week's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. Have you ever had one of those people in your life? You know, the type of person who... You spend time with them and afterwards you just feel completely drained. They just seem to take so much effort to be around and yet we still hang around them. Why is that? Well, today's guest, Dr. Roberta Shaler, is going to tell us all about those people that she calls hijackals. Welcome to the show, Dr. Roberta. Thank you so much, Selena. It's a delight to be with you. So tell us about these people. You've called them hijackals. I love that name. How did, how did you come up with it? Well, my doctorate's in psychology, so I am very sensitive to the fact that people use psychological terms when they really shouldn't be. So I found that so many people were going to the Google goddess and they were saying, my partner, my mother, my coworker behaves this way. And the Google goddess is an index. So the Google goddess without credentials comes back and says, oh, they're a sociopath, a psychopath, a narcissist, a borderline, (laughs) Um, spitting out clinical diagnoses. And 
that's not helpful. You might think it's helpful, but really it's a barrier in some senses because we really need to understand that we're the one in relationship with them. We need to understand what's going on. So I wanted a non-clinical term that would allow us to talk about the patterns, traits, and cycles of these relentlessly difficult, toxic people. Okay, so for the people who are listening, and they've probably already got an inkling that this kind of person is in their life, Mm -hmm. how do you define somebody who is toxic and is relentlessly you know, taking, 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 taking rather than giving back in a relationship? Well, let me give you first my definition of a hijackal. Hijackals are people who hijack relationships for their own purposes, and then they relentlessly scavenge them for power, status, and control. So you are going to feel as though you can't do anything right. Everything is your fault. They have to win. They will one-up you. They will try and degrade, demean, devalue you. All in all and any of those things will happen, and you'll walk away feeling like, wow, something was really off with that, and you may be asking yourself, what's wrong with me? And we really ought to be asking the question, maybe there's something wrong with them. So do we have to take, just on that conversation, do we have to take any responsibility for allowing these people into our lives? Absolutely, which is my point about not labeling them with a psychological label. Because when we do that, unless they have been professionally diagnosed and you're in every right to use that term then, when when we do that, we distance ourselves from them. And then we don't see that we're the ones in relationship with them. So something must be going on with us that makes that acceptable or allows us to be comfortably uncomfortable and yet we go back for more. We're participating in the relationship. So absolutely, we have to take responsibility for being there at all. Okay, so I have a question. When my husband cooks sausages on the barbecue... I have a specific way I like them cooked. And if he, doesn't, if he doesn't cook them my way, then I have to admit I get a bit nitpicky about the whole thing. So am I a hijackal? Like what is the difference between someone who's just <laughs> nitpicky about a specific thing versus like that all-encompassing Yes, <laughs> Certainly, no, no. There's a big difference between nitpicking and, between, and um, with being self-centered And then again, with being a hijackal, there are all degrees of things. Every one of us is somebody's idea of a difficult person at some time. Um, But it's when we're in a pattern of behavior that is significantly impacting to the negative a relationship. And I should say this right now, that hijackals are distinguished in one way because they will paint the public picture of perfection when they're out of the home. But when they're interacting with you, they will paint a completely opposite painful picture in private. And that's one of the things that you will definitely hear that and know, oh, I know exactly then what a hijackal is. Because they are so generous, loving, marvelous, fabulous, giving in public, and then at home, or when they're with you in their, their relationship, they are anything but. They are out to destroy, damage, and demean. That's scary, isn't it? Like I was sitting here thinking of a TV show where I saw somebody like that. I, I, I don't know that I know anyone like this in person now because I, well, not that not knowingly, but I had people like that when I was younger in my teens, you know, teens and early 20s. You always had that friend who had to be better than you. You know, you had a story and they had a story that was better than yours. Or, you know, you wore something and they were always demeaning about, you know, that didn't look that great or it wasn't flattering. And a few of them pop to mind now, but I've been very focused, I guess, in my later years of making sure that those those drama-filled people are no longer in my life. So nobody at the moment pops into my brain but, Yay! Yeah. <laughs> like I do have my, my dad is a bit nitpicky, but you know certainly certainly doesn't go to those kinds of um, extents. 
But can you have these people, like we've said in relationships, and I just want to be really, really clear, that doesn't just have to be like your husband or your wife or your partner, does it? Oh, no. I mean, many people were raised by hijackal parents. So you have a very, very difficult mother or father and you can't quite understand because the entire time you were growing up, you were trying to please them and you couldn't. Um, and so you'll certainly find it in that realm. I've done a lot of work in businesses where you find that, particularly because hijackals will behave like a reverse pinball. I was speaking recently at the California HR conference and someone said to me, what happens to hijackals in the workplace? And I said, brace yourself for the answer. And everybody chuckled. And then I said, they get promoted. Mm. And the reason is that people don't want to deal with them. So they give them a lateral or sometimes a vertical promotion. And so they get rid of them and they have peace in their department or on their team, but they've just shifted the problem within the organization. And they have a way of, you know, they're usually excellent workers. And so they're showing that side of themselves so that they're relatively unfireable for quite a while until they really hurt somebody. But they will move up through the organization as people shift them away. And so you will have them in the next cubicle. You will have them as a boss. You will have them in churches. They're very prevalent in churches because they can have power over people. They can use whatever the, the philosophy, psychology, or doctrine of a spiritual organization to be right and to have power over people. You can have it in all all walks of life, and you will meet them. I just recently today was working with a client who had to go for some uh, therapeutic interaction in a hospital where there was cognitive therapy being done. And as she told me the story of being there for four weeks, the person in charge of that particular area was a complete hijackal. That's scary. Very scary. Very scary. Imagine going to a doctor who's a hijackal or an attorney who's a hijackal. I, do you know what I just had in my brain? Someone has just popped into my head. And this is someone on a volunteer organization. So like a search and rescue type thing that's run by volunteers. And I'm just sitting here thinking in all my times, because I've done a lot of volunteering in my life, I don't wonder if that's, you know, a position that they kind of gravitate towards because you know, if, especially if they can't be the hijackal at work, they can exert their authority over people because the volunteers aren't being paid to be there. You know, they're, they're there out of their own love. And so they can, they can use this, you know, self-professed power to, to, to get that need that, you know, the fire that they need to fuel them. Absolutely. You'll always find them anywhere that there is somebody who cannot find power. They look for a place to find power if they have hijackal tendencies, and then they exert that power. So you can give them a small job, and they will make it into an absolute bastion fortress that they rule. <laughs> <laughs> so and in the volunteer situation, just to add to that, they will, they will hold the organization's history in their hand or they will be the hardest worker or whatever. And if anybody says, you can't speak to me like that, they'll look at you and say, well, I'll just quit then. And they try to play that power of you can't do without me because I'm your best volunteer. But if you don't do what I say, I will threaten to quit so I can keep everything in chaos, which is one of the hallmarks of hijackals is keeping everybody in chaos, ambiguity, uncertainty. I think we've all worked with someone like that. If you've been in corporate, the kind of person who will sell their, you know, sell their soul to the devil to advance and in the meantime, just make everybody else's life hell because of it. Certainly. And they'll stand on your shoulders and then they'll trump on your head. Mm. So what do you do if you encounter one of these people? So now that we've got a pretty good <laughs> idea of, like, I'm sure everybody has somebody popping into their brain right now. What do you do with these people? <laughs> 
Well, I'll try and give you the most serious answer I can. <laughs> we laugh about it because when you're not well, in that situation and, and you know, you looking back in hindsight and things like that, you can laugh about it. But when you're in a situation with one of these people, it can be all encompassing, all consuming, and, you know, it, you can lose all sense of yourself. Absolutely. And that laughter, that's what we call shadow laughter. I'm laughing at something that's not funny because I'm so uncomfortable with it that all I can do is laugh. And, you know, so so we do. We go, well, you know, who can get along with her? <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> but they are everywhere. And in fact, in the statistics show us that they are growing in numbers. And that's sad. And then we go about uh, raising them because we have a generation of people who were raised in a very entitled way. So if they had any tendencies toward becoming a hijacker, we help them on their way by allowing them to be entitled. So there are things happening all around us in all kinds of places that we are much more likely, more and more likely to have to contend. So your question is, what do you do when you meet one? Well, usually what you do is you're your pleasant, wonderful, compassionate, loving self. And they are the best love bombers in the world. So when you meet them, they will charm you. They will manipulate you. They will seduce you. They will exploit you. They will get you on their side. And you will honestly believe that they know you right down to your soul. And so you don't have much for a little while except thinking, isn't this lovely? And then things change. So if you're in a primary relationship with a person like that, they love to get you into their life in a permanent way as quickly as possible. So they'll say things to you like, oh, I just know you're the person I'm going to marry. They'll say this on the first date. I know you're my soulmate. Why don't we just get on with it? The whole idea is to reduce the amount of time that they have to be in their love bombing behavior. They have to be their charming self. So they will tend to try and draw you in so that you feel safe and comfortable and delighted. And when they feel that you are in that position and they have you where they want you, then they will they will take off the facade and they will behave however they choose to behind closed doors. Whether that's behind the door of a cubicle if or an office, I suppose cubicles don't have doors, do they? Um, or it's at home or wherever it is. But the person that you first met is not the person that is really there. And that is a scary place to be, that you could almost feel trapped and... I guess it may be easier, you know, I'm trying to think of a situation. It may be slightly easier to do this if it's your workplace because you may just be able to get another job and leave. But if this is your primary relationship, this is a big step. You know, you've invested emotionally a lot into being with this person that you just, you know, leaving is a big thing. And I'm just, I'm now, all these things are popping into my brain as you speak. I'm sitting here thinking about customers who do this and I have the most beautiful client who now that you talk about this person, these hijackals, she had the hijackal customer from hell who was exactly what you said. She would come into the store and she would be all lovey-dovey and then she'd be, you know, online saying the most nastiest things but then she'd come back in the store and be, oh, you guys are so fantastic. But then again on social media, I went into that shop today and it took three minutes for somebody to serve me. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's exactly what happens. And that's the two-facedness of it as well. But then after, you, if you should say to that person, if they were your, your customer, that you should say, oh, I was very confused by the review that you left me online. They will then say to you, well, I call it like it is, and that's the way it was. Do you know those and, are almost the exact words this customer said to her? Mm -hmm, I'm not surprised. And so you, it, it, 
one of the top hallmarks of hijackles, and I have a whole program called Seeing the Cycles so people can learn all of these, but the top one is that these people, and God bless them, they, they didn't have a hope coming in to this world in order to be different. They were raised in that situation. They may have had some epigenetic markers for it. Their home life was difficult. They may have had a parent who was a hijackal. They may have had an abusive parent or a person who abused substances or some trauma happened to them early in their life. This is the only way they know to do life. It's the only way they know to survive. So we have to have compassion for that. But with that compassion, we can also recognize that we cannot condone or enable the behaviors. So if it is your partner, as you say, and you've been love bombed and, and you've got someone who's now beginning to really demean you, devalue you, degrade you, um, do things that you cannot quite believe they did it and you keep wanting to give them the benefit of the doubt and 36 more chances, um, it's really time to wake up and smell the herbal tea. It truly is because you keep thinking, what can I do? What can I do? If only I were more kind, more patient, if I stopped nagging, if I were more compassionate, if I understood more deeply the situation, you take it on yourself because you're a good person. And that's lovely. But when you're dealing with a hijackal, they're taking advantage of that. That's why they sought you out. And so you get enmeshed. And as I say, they want to have this relationship go somewhere quickly because they don't want to keep up the pretense of being that love bomber. So they they get you and they get you enmeshed in, in their finances. And, and then they say things like, oh, well, you don't have to worry about finance. I'll take care of it all. Pretty soon they have control of all the money. I've even had clients, Selena, where they were working with me to prepare to leave and they could not believe that they went to the bank and found their name had been taken off the house. They didn't know about it, but the hijackal husband in that case had gone in and said, my wife is very, very ill. She can't come in. We've got to put this, this piece of property into a trust soon, and she's probably not going to live. So please take her name off it so that I can move this so that it will be protected. Wow. These things happen because remember, they're going to manipulate everyone. So it's not surprising that they manipulated the person at the bank. I had another client whose husband took another woman into the mobile phone store and she posed as his wife and agreed to have her name taken off and stop her cell phone service. That's kind of the thing of movies, isn't it? You, you, it's hard to believe this happens in real life. Yes, and I get examples of it many times a day because I have clients all over the world because I work by video conferencing, and it happens everywhere, Selena, everywhere. And I'm just thinking back to this this customer that we're talking about, and she actually signed a piece of, you know, you know signed an agreement about the goods you know, essentially she was waiting for goods to be delivered and, you know, it takes a little while sometimes for these things to arrive. And she'd, she'd made such a big fuss that my client got her to sign something about when it was due to arrive because she was so sick of this. And even though, you know, she'd signed this document, she was out of the store and back on social media complaining that her goods still hadn't turned up. Well, of course. And then if she were confronted with the fact that she signed this, she'd say, well, I just did that to get you off my back. Something very, very similar to that. Yes. <laughs> so what do we do? How do we get away from these people? Well, first of all, we have to work on ourselves. First of all, if, we, if we're not being sexually or physically abused and we're endeavoring to get away from emotional and verbal abuse, we do our own work first. Because what could be worse than to focus on getting out of the relationship and not be empowered and go sitting in some new apartment and not having strength and clarity and empowerment. So we do our own work first. That means that we look at what's my part in this relationship? How can I clearly see what the other person is doing? 
how can I learn more about these relationships? Like I have Facebook groups, I have websites, I have all of that where people can learn or my YouTube channel. Is steep yourself in understanding that this really does go on. You know, the people in my Facebook groups, they're chatting. This happened to me. Oh, it happened to me too. And, you know, and so you you get some validation because you're never going to get validation from a hijackal. They will not validate you. They want to tell you what you think and feel and need and want. They want to define your reality for you. So you get to that place where you don't even trust yourself. You second guess yourself all the time. You question your sanity. And so first of all, you do your own work. Where in my background did I ever encounter this before? What unresolved issues might I have in my life that now I see that I had a hijackal parent myself or there were was a hijackal close to me when I was growing up? Or what do I now value that is not being valued in this relationship? And why do I allow myself to condone and enable this? Next step, what are the skills that I need to do? What is the mindset change that I need to make? The next step is how do I prepare to leave? You have to be prepared to leave if that's what you're going to do. And then there's all the issues of the children if we're talking about your spousal relationship. If you if you have somebody who is a customer like this, how do we deal with the customer is always right? This whole mentality of, you know, I should bow down to the customer. And I'm just trying to... I guess not negate the fact that this could be a partner because it's a very heavy topic. I guess I'm kind of lightening up a little bit <laughs> and, <laughs> and trying to just kind of say, you know, yes, it can be, it can be in a relationship. And if, if that's a situation that you're in right now, obviously this, you know, you may be triggered, but if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, I don't know if I have one of those people, but maybe I have a customer like that in business. How would you deal with that? Would you just kind of say, look, you're not welcome here anymore. Well, I think the first thing that you do, it's an incremental process. The first thing, if they're not somebody who comes regularly, but they do have their say-so all ready for you, I think the most valuable thing that I can tell anybody to ever do while they're gathering their thoughts is when somebody re says something opposite to what you think, you just simply say, you could be right. And then speak about what you want to speak about. Because when you say to somebody who's planning to burst your bubble by being nasty or, or um, forceful, they, and you say, well, you could be right, something happens in the brain called the disin disinhibiting of the neocortex. <laughs> and you have a few seconds there where they go, oh, I wasn't expecting that result. Now what do I do? And there's a little minute of confusion there. So then you can begin to speak and you can then speak only from your policies, practices and procedures manual. <laughs> you say, well, here we endeavor to do this for the customer or here we, we make sure that all our our employees are treated with respect in the same way that we treat our customers with respect. So you begin to say some things that are truths. They're statements of fact. Because what happens with a hijackal is they want to run and believe that emotions are facts. So they create things that we call emotional facts. So it's a fact that I get upset every time I come into the store. Well, that's an emotional fact for you. It has nothing to do with the store, but they're endeavoring to make it sound as though there's something terribly wrong with the store. Mm, mm. So it's important that you speak as the, as the business owner or the employee that you speak in a fact after you have said something. Well, acknowledge the emotionality. Say, I'm sorry that you're upset and not but. I'm sorry you're upset and we have a store policy that is thus. Or I'm sorry that you're upset and I can understand that you would prefer that to be different. However, this is what we do. And so you, you acknowledge and validate their right to have their feeling 
but then you meet it with a fact and a policy or a practice. That you could be right is such a diffuser. I've told my daughter that if you know if anybody ever is nasty you at, to you at school, to say something similar to that back because the bullies that you know when they say that they go yeah I am right, <laughs> and if she mm-hmm. if she comes back and says yeah you could be right. There's kind of no, there's nothing left to argue about. <laughs> That's right. And it takes the wind out of the sails for a bit. You know, my mother was a hijackal. And I remember when I was 15, I was always way older than my years. I was, I was 15 and she used to come home from going to church things and business things and all she worked. And she would say, well, I really took the wind out of her sails. And I remember one day coming out of the fog of trying to ignore that my mother existed And I heard it and I said to her, well, it seems to me a wiser thing to do would be to take your sail out of her wind. And at that moment, my mother fell silent. I can imagine. She was stuttering, but, 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 you know, and that's what I mean about disinhibiting the neocortex. She had a plan that the conversation was going to go one way. I said that and the conversation was derailed. And so there was time for regrouping. And then she said, you always have something to say, don't you? Right. (laughs) You could be right. (laughs) You could be right. Exactly. (laughs) Oh, I think you have given everybody who's listening. I think that as you know, they've been walking down memory lane and, and if you, if they, if, if you are listening and you're in a position like this and you you've realized that maybe you are in a personal relationship or a business relationship with one of these hijackals, where could they come to get some more advice from you? Well, certainly to my website, that's for F O R relationship help, H E L P.com for relationship help.com. So there you'll find everything. Um, You will also find my my gift to you, which is a copy of my ebook called How to Spot a Hijackal. So if there's any wondering that's going on with you, is this just a sometimes difficult person or is this a hijackal? Go and grab a copy. Just go to fourrelationshiphelp.com. Also, if you're visual, I have 150 videos on my YouTube channel, which surprisingly enough is called for relationship help. <laughs> so if you're looking for relationship help, it seems <laughs> like Dr. Roberta Shaler has probably got some information there that can help you. Dr. Roberta, thank you so much for sharing all of this. I, I really want to make sure that if anyone has been triggered by this episode, they jump over to your website, they reach out to you for a bit of help, and they can start on that path of being more empowered themselves and releasing themselves from those kinds of toxic relationships. So thank you so much for sharing this information with my listeners today. Well, thank you, Selena. It's really important that people understand that. And if people also are interested in a podcast, I have one called Save Your Sanity, Help for Handling Hijackals. So there's lots of good things in addition to all the good work you're doing, Selena. Thank you so much for having me. Not a problem. We'll make sure we link to that in the show notes. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. You can find all of the show notes over at selenanight.com. If you found something that you heard today particularly useful, I'd love it if you could leave me a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And of course, feel free to share this episode with someone that you think could benefit by listening to it. Want more retail biz strategies? You can watch the Bringing Business to Retail TV show where each week I'll answer a question or provide you with a simple, actionable retail biz strategy that you can implement in your business right away. If you have a question or a guest, I'd love to hear from you. Drop my team an email at podcast at and I'll see you on the next episode. Have a great week.